Hey there, I'm uh, Dave Sutton, and I am a results leader. You're listening to ResultsLeader.fm. Being a thought leader is easy. Getting results is hard. This show is for the results leader who lives and dies by their results. Here is your host and chief results leader, Jonathan Rivera. You are listening to ResultsLeader.fm. Welcome back to another fun-filled edition. Today is going to be really excellent because we have a transformational marketer. That's right. He's enabling businesses to reach, connect, and engage with customers in a way that gives them a reason to care. Today's guest is Mr. Dave Sutton. Let's jump in. Dave, welcome to the show. I am glad you're here, brother. Hey, it's great to be here, Jonathan. All right. Let's give our listeners a quick win with this first question. What book or books have you given most as a gift? Well, I, you know, I shamelessly have to promote my own book, right? I give my uh, Marketing Interrupted is my re- most recent book and one that I, uh, I, I give away most frequently, both for business reasons. Plus, I think it's really an engaging, fun read. But then, you know, I also read a lot of I read a lot of fiction. I'm, I'm kind of a John Grisham hound, so I'm I find myself kind of burning through his books and then giving them away to my friends. So you said you give your book away for business reasons. How do you use your book in your business? You know, primarily I use it as a way to. You know, I, I kind of refer to it sometimes as a thick brochure. You know, it's a it's a great way to tell our story through the eyes of our clients' stories. So. Uh, I'm a big believer that, you know, in our in our business, if my client isn't successful, I can't possibly be successful or claim success. And so I love telling stories through the eyes of our clients and essentially sharing those as not only lessons learned, but also great ways to highlight what I think are really some amazing marketers and some amazing people that are doing some very transformational things. I'd like for you to share a story with us on how an apparent failure set you up for later success? Wow. Well, I'll tell you about one from my early my early uh, career, actually, even before I started my career. When I was in uh, university, believe it or not, I was studying to be a doctor. I was a pre-med student in my first semester at school. And I, you know, I'm, like, I'm a guy who loves chemistry and science and biology and even organic chemistry. I'm one of those kooky, crazy people that actually did really well in organic, organic chemistry and calculus. But I'll tell you something, I learned the hard way, be careful kind of what you wish for, because in my second semester, I had to do an internship at a hospital. It's part of our curriculum. And I discovered that two important things. One is I get violently ill when I see blood. (laughs) And second, I really don't like hanging around with sick people very much. And so I, I kind of learned through the process that, you know, to be a doctor, you've got to have more than just, you know, intelligence IQ. You've got to have a level of uh, emotional intelligence and also a, a stomach for the business. And so that failure, you know, it essentially was kind of a misplaced set of expectations on my part. I had to scramble because I also wanted to graduate. And so from that failure, I basically had to repurpose all my math and my science and my, my chemistry. And I ended up going to engineering school instead of medical school um, or down the medical school path. And that's kind of what's brought me to where I am today, which is really, I, f- I feel like I learned how to be a great problem solver in engineering school, uh, which prepared me to be ready for marketing. Uh, because I think for, for a lot of people, think people usually think of marketing as a creative science, but it's really a science and an art. And I think my background in, in science and, and being able to solve tough, intractable problems really got me ready for dealing with the challenges of sales and marketing. What would you say is the most worthwhile investment you've ever made? You know, I'd say um, talking about myself, I mean, I think my investing in my education, investing in continuous learning uh, has been has made a difference for me in my career. I'm one of those people that I never really take things at face value. I like to dig in and I like to really deeply understand things before I, I form a judgment or, or make a decision. And I think I've learned that through the process of you know my education as well as my my willingness to kind of have nonstop learning in my life. I mean, I I read voraciously. I love to kind of stay up to date on what's going on. And again, that's an investment of, of a big amount of time. But I found it translate into 
uh, an ability to really see things sometimes a little bit differently, or maybe not so much differently, but more completely than other folks do. Because I've, I've taken the time to kind of do my homework and not just because I had to do my homework, because I like doing homework. I like doing the background research and I like going deep on subjects. So I think investing that time has been uh, made a big difference for me in my in my life and in my career. And it kind of cascades into my business as well. I think in the service industry, you have to be willing to invest in your clients as much as they invest in you. And I think early on, I learned that you know sometimes the things that we do to help others in terms of their business or their careers, it doesn't always pay dividends immediately when it comes to your bottom line. But what does end up happening over, over a long-term career is those things come back as little gestures, whether they're referrals for new business, or it's a kind word in a, in a tweet, you know, that, or a response to a, a tweet or an article that you publish. Or sometimes it's, you know, a reward of a, a new project or a big opportunity because you were willing to make an investment early in your career in, in someone else's brand or someone else's business or someone else's career. So I try to find every day, Jonathan, little ways to make investments in the people around me because I, you never just never know where that's going to lead. Now, some people, and uh, I was having this conversation uh, the other day uh, with some friends, some people go to school, they go to university, they spend all those years learning, and they think that uh, when they graduate, they've learned everything. So how, how have you kept that appetite for learning all these years later? I guess part of it is I, I, I don't trust myself, <laughs> right? So at some level, I guess I've always been a very intellectually curious person, right? And if you're curious, you kind of, just when you think you've figured something out, that's when you get a surprise or there's something new, some new data, some new insight is presented. So I guess it, kind of like what I said in my, my last uh, answer, I, I never take things at, at face value and I never assume that I've completely cracked the code on everything. Part of that is, like I said, a, a curiosity. Part of it is, I think, and this may not necessarily be a good thing, but I've got sort of a discomfort with the status quo. Like, I'm actually one of those crazy people that likes change, and I like to see things evolve, and I don't assume that you know what worked yesterday is going to work exactly the same way today. So the learning part of it for me is part curiosity, but it's also part just an acknowledgement that the world around us is changing so quickly that you can't just sit back and assume you know everything. And certainly the things that I, I learned in university many years ago have in my industry dramatically changed. I mean, think about marketing. When I first came out of school, marketing meant basically broadcast, radio, print, you know, maybe trade shows. I mean, it was, it was a very analog view of the world. Um, and th if I had just kind of stayed on that track, it would have been very, very difficult to maintain and, and thrive in a marketing career. So the, the, the willingness to acknowledge that, you know, I, I was a marketer pre-internet, <laughs> right? And so having gone through that transformation and seeing how much you know, dramatically changed our industry, I guess that was just a reminder to me that, hey, you can't rest on your laurels. You've got to stay fresh and you've got to be on the cutting edge. Otherwise, you'll be on the cutting floor. I like that. That's a quotable. Stay on the cutting edge or you'll be on the cutting floor. Somebody note that. Somebody. <laughs> In the last five years, what new belief, behavior, or habit has most improved your life? Oh, gosh. I can speak directly because coming out of this pandemic, I'll give you a very, very personal story. In the same way that I have a passion for learning, I probably don't have as much of a passion for exercise and, and taking care of myself. But, you know, one of the things that the, the silver lining for me in going through the pandemic and going through the lockdowns was I had to find ways to kind of energize myself. Again, most of us take this for granted. You know, if you go to an office every day, you get up, you might work out or something in the morning, you go to the office, you expend a ton of energy, believe it or not, just in terms of the going through the routine of the day at the office meeting with people, talking to people, interacting with people. Um, you expend a lot of energy doing that. And, and, and as a result of that, you feel spent at the end of the day. You, you feel like you've accomplished something, not just mentally, but physically a lot of times. Uh, after a busy day at the office, I would feel drained, right? Well, during the pandemic, you know, when you're sitting at home and it's hard to kind of get out of your pajamas and go to the office, right? It's easy to kind of get in, fall into a routine that's not as, let's say, energetically challenging, you know, as a traditional work environment is. And so I had to find ways to challenge myself. And, and I think one of the, one of the patterns of behavior that I got into that's I, to this day, I'm still, uh, I'm still a huge advocate for is 
I'm constantly moving, right? So a lot of times, like the first time we did our call, I probably was sitting in the office, but most of the calls that I take, I'm walking, I'm running, I'm out, I'm moving. And I've gotten to the point where now my, my pattern is I'm over, generally speaking, over 20,000 steps a day, just moving and working. So instead of sitting at a desk and having kind of this as a frame of reference for doing work, I've made it a mobile experience, okay? And in doing so, not only has it you know, helped me fulfill that energy re- re-energization that I was getting at the, at the work environment, it also is better for my health. You know, I'm actually, I'm not uh, as maybe, you know, kind of stagnant, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, day-to-day getting things done. I'm very dynamic and very out and moving and, and trying to be as productive as I possibly can, taking care of myself physically, mentally, spiritually, kind of all at once. And I, plus, I love it. I mean, I love, I've met more of my neighbors. You know, it's, it's amazing. I've lived in the same neighborhood for six years and it wasn't until the pandemic that I actually got to meet them, you know, person to person. So, and that's another great way to drive a lot of energy into your life is like, you know, just making more connections with people that you, you know, are in your community, but maybe you don't necessarily see every day. What are some bad recommendations you hear in your area of expertise? You need to spend more money. That's probably number one. It's one of my pet peeves is, I always get asked a question or a variant of that question, Jonathan, especially around like Super Bowl time, right? <laughs> it's like when people are asking, well, you know, is it really worth it to spend, you know, $6.5 million for a 30 second spot in the Super Bowl? And my, my typical answer is sort of no, <laughs> it's not worth it. But sometimes the, the recommendation has nothing to do with marketing ROI. It's someone's ego or, or it's, there's another imperative associated with making that kind of investment. So I'm not a big believer in, you know, big budgets equal big results. I think some of the best experience I've personally had has been working with smaller brands, medium, mid-market size companies that have what I'll call Inc. 5,000 budgets, but they're able to parlay that into Fortune 500 impact. And the way, the way they do that is by recognizing that, you know, it's not all about spending money. It's not all about how you deploy your resources through media. Media is just one way of connecting with customers and giving them a reason to care about your business, a reason to listen to you, a reason to buy your stuff. There are a lot of other very, in in this day and age, more authentic and more, I would say, relevant ways to meet customers where they are. And they don't always require a lot of money. And the internet, we can thank the internet for a lot of this because, and you see this every day, it's, it's, I don't know if you want to go down this path or not, but there's a good news, bad news thing to this, right? When when you've only got you know three television channels and a, and, a, and a handful of ways to reach people, it made sense to throw a lot of money into those three those three baskets, right? Today you've got so many choices that you have to be much more strategic about how you deliver your story through multiple channels in a way that's relevant, timely, not interrupting people's lives, authentic. Um, so it's gotten much more complicated, but the good news is it, it can also be done in a much more cost-effective way. And so I try to guide people whenever they ask me that question, you know, the, the worst recommendation is spend more money. The better recommendation is, you know, spend the appropriate amount of money, but do the homework and figuring out where best to, you know, deploy that investment. And that sometimes takes a little bit of, you know, harder work and elbow grease than just throwing money at the problem. You said something interesting there, getting your story out there but not interrupting people's lives. What did you mean by that? Well, I think, you know, the, the, we're living in an environment right now. This actually, you know, I'll give credit where credit is due. There was work done on this probably about 20, maybe 25 years ago now, a book called The Attention Economy. And it was, I think it actually predated when the internet really took off. I mean, it's about that same time frame. but, and I, I can't remember the author's name off the top of my head, but the, the book was really kind of highlighting the fact that, you know, the, the scarce resource for most people is time and attention. And this is particularly a big problem in the marketing world because, you know, on average today, most consumers are being hit by anywhere from five to 10,000 messages a day. Uh, some of that's very conscious. It's in your face. It's a billboard on the way to work. Some of it's more subtle, like things that pop up on your phone or maybe, you know, interstitial advertising on TV when you're watching your favorite sports program, right? But because of that problem, most advertising from a consumer's perspective looks like you're interrupting my life. You're you're trying to create essentially a way to connect with me, but at the cost of me disconnecting from something else, which is kind of a little bit unfair if you think about it, right? Like if I'm really into this television program, I'm listening to this podcast and 
I get sort of this interstitial, like, you know, hey, buy some stuff just because you happen to listen to this channel. It, it's actually frustrating, you know, and, and it actually disrupts the way we think, the way we're experiencing a brand or the way we're experiencing a message or a celebrity or a sports activity. And it's it's also somewhat rude, right? That if you really thought about it, how much better it would be instead of interrupting me to get your message across, why don't you meet me on my terms, right? So there, there may be a time when I really do want to hear your message. I really want to hear your story, but deliver in a way that's not disrupting some other aspect of my life. Get to know me better, right? Like personalize it so it's, hey, Dave, I, I know you're busy right now, but when you get a chance, I'd love you to hear my story and find a way to essentially fit into the pattern of that person's life as opposed to you know jumping up and down on the stage and saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. And unfortunately, I think a lot of advertising historically has, has really focused on just trying to get people's attention at any cost. And the result of that is that, and, and you probably feel this, Jonathan, in your in your business, people just go numb. You know, they, they don't have any capacity left to have an authentic conversation with you because there's no space left. I mean, it's just everything's been a blur and nothing stands out from the crowd. And as you know, in, in branding and marketing, you know, the name of the game is differentiation. And it's even simpler than that from my perspective. It's you know, what's your story and how am I going to experience your story? Everything else around that is noise, right? Any other kind of entertaining ways or tricks or memes or things that you want to throw at me, it's it's interesting. But if I don't get your story and I don't have an authentic experience living into that story with you or you sharing that story with me, likelihood is you got six seconds with me and I'm gone. All right. All right, I know you were getting into that and we were just about to get into my favorite part where we talk about results. But first, I wanna ask you a question. Are you picking up what we're laying down on this show? Are you digging what we are sharing? If you are, why not make yourself a hero today and share this with somebody who can use it? Put this out on your social media channels, hashtag results leader. FM. I'll be out there looking for you and I'll make sure to boost it up too when I see you. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's jump back into the interview. Let's talk about results, Dave. Why do results matter? Well, you know, one of the things I, I've, I've been quoted and saying before is if you've got a great story and you've got a great strategy, right? That's wonderful. And that's the foundation for marketing, right? That's that's a way, if you've got a story and you've got a clear way, a line of sight to telling it to somebody that cares about it, or you can give them a, a reason to care about it. That's fundamentally what marketing is all about. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people have great stories without a strategy. And I call that art. <laughs> you know, right? So if you've got, if you've got, a, there's nothing wrong with it, by the way. I mean, if, if you are a wonderful storyteller, you know, Ken Burns, um, you know, of PBS fame and, you know, all the different documentaries he's, he's done, he has fantastic stories, has amazing deep research. But other than buying his product, which is, you know, watching his shows, he's not selling you anything else. It's really, it's a high art form. It's a fantastic series of stories with really no strategic or commercial imperative behind it, right? And I think sometimes what happens with marketing is people fall in love with that, the art part of it. And they assume that just because I'm really super entertaining, I'm telling a great story, I give away great education, whatever the big wow is with my, my messaging. If it doesn't at some point come back to a strategic imperative or, or fulfilling someone's wants and needs, it's nothing more than just entertaining, right? It's, it's art. Nothing wrong with that. Just don't call it marketing. <laughs> you know, it kind of goes back to my comments earlier about the Super Bowl. People always ask me like, what, you know, what are your favorite Super Bowl ads? And what, what are the ones that you think really resonated with people? I'm like, the ones that sold more stuff. There, there's a, an old story my, my mentor, Sergio Zeman tells, and I, this may be a little bit of urban legend, but, you know, he says that he pulled one of the most famous Super Bowl ads of all time is the Mean Joe Green Super Bowl ad for Coca-Cola. And it, it did fantastic well. I mean, scored off the charts amazing tearjerker kind of heart-wrenching kind of a, a story in a very short 30-second clip. And I won't bore you with all the details of it, but he specifically pulled it off the air because they could not correlate that advertisement with any increase in sales. That takes a lot of guts to do that, by the way. One of the most popular, most entertaining, most memorable commercials of all time, they pulled it off because it didn't sell more Coke. 
And it takes that kind of discipline to be in the marketing game, I think. You know, if he if his job was to entertain people with tearjerker commercials, maybe he should have been producing movies with Spielberg, you know, or something. It's there's nothing wrong with it. Just don't call it marketing. <laughs> you know? I dig it, man. So let's think back. Over the last five years, what new realization has helped? you get better results for your clients? A uh, new realization. I, I guess probably just a, a deep, I have a deeper appreciation and understanding as an older person, you know, as, as a more mature person, I'll say. I have a deeper appreciation and understanding of some of the complexities of working in large corporations today. And, and without getting too much in the weeds on this, I'll give you, I'll give you a couple of examples. But you know, when, I, when I first started my career, I was always in a very entrepreneurial environment. I was very lucky. I didn't know the difference between, you know, a, a big corporate behemoth company like a, a Coca-Cola or a Home Depot or a UPS and working in a more entrepreneurial kind of, you know, making it up as you go, no barriers, governance didn't mean anything and compliance was not a problem and all those kinds of things, right? And as a result of that, I think I grew up as a, as a younger person thinking that it was like that everywhere, that you could basically, you know, if you had a great idea, you had the passion, you had the resources, you had the backing of your boss, right? That you could make things crazy, successful things happen. And I think because I never really worked for a, a super large corporate kind of environment, I just assumed that pockets of that existed everywhere. And, and I, I think I probably can date this back to maybe five or six years ago when I started working with some, some larger companies. And I, I discovered that the things that I was asking my clients to do sometimes were just not from their perspective, they weren't possible. Not because they didn't think it was a good idea, but because it would cross a line between, uh, I'm making this up, but, you know, between sales and marketing or between marketing and customer service or between marketing and product development. In, in an entrepreneurial environment, a lot of times those three functions or four functions are run by the same person, <laughs> right? So it's pretty easy. It's unless you've got sort of a schizophrenia thing going on, it's pretty easy to solve those types of problems. In bigger companies, those silos exist and they're really hard to break down. The second thing that I saw was that there's also a lot of what, what I would characterize as institutional memory. In the bigger the company, the bigger the memory, or the or the longer the memory, right? So there's more of what I would call not not invented here or sacred cows. Like we can't we can't do that. That'll mess with Bob's you know, pension, whatever, right? And overcoming that or, or kind of forgetting things in large institutions, the more and deeper your memory is, the harder it is to forget. And I think entrepreneurs, again, what makes people successful in smaller startups is you can take a risk, you can fall flat on your face, you dust yourself off, get up, and you can forget about it, right? Big companies, it's it's hard to do that. In some cultures, it's really hard to do that. You fall down once and there's no one there to help pick you up, right? So for me, the realization was I may have to be that, you know, I may have to help pick some people up. And maybe my job is not so much about making the brand successful. It's about making the people who build and activate the brand successful. And so, you know, starting about five, like I said, five or six years ago, we at TopRight came to the realization that, you know, we should be really excited when one of our clients gets promoted. That should be a celebration. You know, it's like Sally went from being a director of, of brand to a VP. That's great that we made Sally successful. And sometimes those little victories, in from Sally's perspective, a big victory, are actually more common than we launched an entirely new product for XYZ company, right? So by creating a focus on helping people be successful, helping them navigate the landmines of big corporations, helping them forget some of the institutional baggage and, and navigate through some of that baggage and focusing on how we make those people successful in their own careers, that's a really noble cause from my perspective. I mean, it's, it's a more noble cause than look at all the wonderful work I've done for you know, to sell more cans of fizzy water or whatever, right? Um, and so that that's probably, for me, probably one of the most important realizations in the last five to six years is just making your business more about a purpose uh, with a central noble cause as opposed to just selling more stuff to more people. I can't help but think, I don't know if it was during our pre-interview or where it was that you and I talked about it, uh, but you mentioned something about transformational marketing and now... I get what you're saying. Now I put the pieces together. So that that that's awesome uh, to hear it come around. So what area of your business would you like better results? Where would I like in my, in my business? I, I look around, again, like I said earlier, I'm very uncomfortable with the status quo. <laughs> so sometimes, and this is going to sound terrible, but I intentionally break things to see if we can make them better. 
and, and not, you know, not in a bad way, but I, sometimes I'll look at a situation, I'll go, well, why the heck are we doing it that way? I think one thing that I see, and our, we have a great team here at Top Right, and people that are very, what I would, what I would characterize as not only intellectually curious, but very resilient, right? So, and I think that's hard to, that's hard to train. You know, it, it's really hard to train people to be like that. You have to actually have a little bit of experience as you, in your very first question, you have to, you know, know what failure is in order to really truly and deeply appreciate success. But if there's one thing that I, I would like to see us improve on, it would be on that, what I would characterize as our own investment in ourselves. Because I, I think we as consultants, agencies, you know, in the service industry, we constantly get trapped in this, what I, what I call kind of the, the shoemaker's dilemma, right? It's, we're great at making shoes for other people, but our kids have none. And part of it is just economics. It's like, if you're true, if you have a noble cause, like we're going to make our clients successful and all of our energy goes towards building that, you know, capability to help them succeed, you're always kind of your, your own kids and your own team is kind of at the end of the, the, the line. And when we run out of resources, the client doesn't go hungry, we go hungry. And there's some nobility in that, as I said, but there's also sort of, you have to recognize it well, maybe we're not doing enough to build ourselves up so that we can continue you know, to do to complete that that noble cause or, or deliver that value. And so I, I'd like to see us improve and maybe getting a little bit more timely, probably more than anything. I think we episodically do a good job of of train making sure someone's trained or get them you know access to something, some capability that they need. But it's more reactive. It's not necessarily proactive. And I, I think that's an area where I'd like to see us improve. If for no other reason than I think it it uh, It'll limit our growth if, if we don't really make those types of investments in our own people to get them to the next level and make them successful, get them promoted so that, you know, again, we celebrate when our people go to work for the client in the same way because we've essentially created a new client and if that when that happens. What results are you most proud of? Well, I'm proud I got two kids out of college. <laughs> uh, one of them off the payroll, which is a, a great accomplishment for those of you know, your listeners out there who've gone through that process. I'm very proud of that. I'm proud that I've been married for 32 years to a wonderful woman. And uh, I, I heard a great saying the other day, and, and I'll try to not make it an off-color version, more of a, an appropriate version. But, you know, I have, I have a, an amazing wife and I've got an amazing imagination. <laughs> and if you got those two things, you can have an amazing marriage and it'll last for a long time. So, I mean, I, I'm very proud of that because it does. And, and I know that this is probably preaching to the choir, but it's hard. You know, it's hard to kind of keep a, a relationship alive and thriving. And then I'm proud of, you know, what we've built here in the business, you know, and, and again, I'd like to say that I had it all figured out, you know, in 2007, when we, when we launched this business, but to be honest with you, I, what we said back then and what we are today are like light years apart, right? I mean, we we have been uh, through a number of iterations of reinventing ourselves. And I think the good news with that and what makes me proud is that we've been able to survive as a result of that, right? So we've been through the recession of 2008 and 2009. We've been now through this pandemic. And every time we come through one of those, I look back and I go, wow, how do we survive? <laughs> it's like, what was it? that? What was the secret sauce? And I think part of the secret sauce and, and something that makes me proud is that it's that resilience that I mentioned earlier. It's also the willingness to let things go. I mean, sometimes you do, like during the recession, we lost one of our largest clients. And to be honest with you at the time, I really thought about going to battle. You know, it's like, let's go win them back, right? And it would have been a dying cause. I mean, if we had taken all of our energy to go win back a client, in the midst of that, by the way, they were one of the largest subprime lenders in, in the industry in, in 2008. Yeah, they were about two weeks away from going out of business anyway. So if we'd focused on that, it would have been a lost cause. We would have would, you know, died on the battlefield along with everybody else. But instead, we pivoted and we got into a complete, we moved into the healthcare industry, something we knew very little about, but we decided to double down and move in that direction. And it saved the business. It kind of kept us afloat during the, the downtimes. And then as things pick back up, we were, we were staged and ready to grow. So sometimes you do have to let go. You just have to say, hey, you know, that's, we're done here. This, this well is dry. We need to move on. And so I'm, I'm proud of the fact that we sometimes take those really hard decisions. And sometimes you lose people. Sometimes you lose clients. But if you kind of stick to the overarching purpose, what you stand for, your why, right? That's usually a good way to navigate through those types of difficulties. Powerful powerful. There is a lot there. You guys need to listen to that a couple times. 
So any parting thoughts for the results leaders out there listening to us? Um, you know, I, I, this, again, I don't want to, I don't want to make this up. I'll get off my soapbox here, but saying that you're a results leader, it comes with a, a level of commitment that I think a lot of people aren't really ready for. So, so, you know, it, it's everywhere, right? I mean, I've been in, in this industry my whole career and everybody talks about the wonderful results that they get. And of course, no case study. There's very few case studies out there. Uh, and I'll tell you a brief story about this in a second, but there are very few case studies. If you look at anybody's website that end in, this was a failure, <laughs> right? So everybody's getting results every time on every project and everything they do. That should make you scratch your head and go, well, what about the failures? And I had a really smart client prospect actually once, this was about 10 years ago, go through my website and, and started looking at all the, uh, went through every one of our case studies at the time. And he was surprised to find that we had a couple of case studies where the punchline was, this didn't work out. And we published it. I, he's like, I knew you guys were authentic because I, I knew if you could honestly say you tried your best and this didn't work, that you were probably the guys I wanted to work with. I mean, you're the people that I, I could trust. I knew that you would give me the straight, you know, you would not give me political, polite, you know, talk. You would speak strength and speak truth to me about, about what was going on. And then if it wasn't working, you'd be the first one to say, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm, I can't help you. And you won't waste my money, right? So I think being a results leader, just embedded in those two words itself, it means I would say you're a leader first. And if you're a great leader, you'll generate great results. And you'll also have failures. But as a great leader, you'll learn from those failures and you'll be able to magnify the results the next time you go through that process, right? But just saying that you generate results, I think you really have to look inside and, and kind of authentically ask yourself, you know, how much of a result really was that? I mean, did we really have an impact or was it just, we did what we said we were going to do and moved on. And that also is the difference between transformation, truly making a, uh, an impactful change as opposed to a transaction or, or sort of a, we helped move it, you know, the needle from A to B and we moved on. That's one of the reasons why most of our projects and the things we, we enjoy working on, they're big, hairy problems. I mean, they're things that people, most other people look at and go, oh my gosh, that's too hard. I don't want to do that. But if it's worth doing, I mean, the, a transformational project is likely to, you know, generate outsized benefits and results, much more so than a kind of tactical or, or you know, transactional project, which may, you, know, you may move the needle, but I don't, I don't really hold those out as big wins. I hold those out as, you know, kind of maybe little wins that, you know, over time, if your whole life's about a bunch of little wins, it's just not as exciting. Powerful. So... There's no doubt in my mind that our listeners are going to want to hear more from you. Where can they get more, Dave? A couple of different places. By the way, I, in addition to reading voraciously, I blog, I, I write like three or four times a week. And by the way, I don't do that just to kind of promote myself. I do it because I think it's a disease. Um, it's like, it's if it doesn't get out of my head onto paper or onto the screen, it kind of gets, I get clogged up up here. So I do write a tremendous amount. And I'm always looking for great things to write about. It's one of the ways that I connect with people is I'm not trying to sell you anything. I just want to write about, I want to about, you know, tell good stories. So toprightpartners.com is, is our website. It's toprightpartners.com is where I blog on the insights page there. And you'll, you'll find me there two or three times a, a week, at least. Usually something short form, just kind of interesting stuff that I like, or I find that's um, kind of interesting to talk about. And usually one or two long form, which might be a, a client story it might be something amazing going on. Like right now, I'm doing a lot of uh, research on artificial intelligence and machine learning, trying to figure out how that's going to transform marketing. So a lot of times I'm just doing what I would characterize as kind of study work, you know, kind of sharing findings that I, I come across. You can also reach me, obviously, at TopRight. I don't know if you want us to get phone numbers and things like that or not. But Whatever you want to put out there, brother, this is your time. Yeah, area code 678-384-6700 here at our headquarters in Atlanta. And I'm also out there, obviously, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter. My handle on Twitter is at Top Right Partner. We will be sure to share links to all of that in the show notes. We've been talking to Dave Sutton. Thank you, results leaders, for tuning in, and we will be back in your earbuds next time. That is a wrap for another edition of ResultsLeader.fm. If you are out there getting results for your clients, and you want to be featured on the show, go to resultsleader.fm now and apply to be on the show. And if you love what you're hearing, share the show, 
give us a rating and review, do anything to help us get the message out there. Thought leadership is easy, but results leadership is hard. This is the podcastfactory.com.